All right. They are just coming in. Welcome, welcome everyone. It is lovely to see so many people joining us today for this session. We are going to give a couple of minutes as people make their way in and then we will uh, get started. Um, if everyone could make a point of muting yourself as you arrive, that would be incredibly helpful. There's, uh, you know, there's a lot of us here today, so making sure that people are muting, uh, that would be very helpful uh, today. And we will formally start in about a minute. We just want to make sure everyone has the chance to get in. Can, uh, can people who are logging in now, can you just do a quick raise of your virtual hand that you can hear us? Huzzah! We have virtual hands going up. Wonderful. All right. This is lovely. Uh, if you also want to, in the chat, do a very quick uh, introduction to yourself um, I think that would be great and where you're located. Um, it would be lovely to get a sense of who is here in the room. Um, while you do that, I'm also going to turn captions on. Um, they might be helpful for some of the people here. So we will add captions and enable captions as well. Um, okay. Lena, would you uh, like to, to kick us off? Yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, annual conference of IC Ethics. My name is Lina Tahran, and I'm the chair of uh, the International Committee on Ethical Dilemmas. This committee was established in September 2019 during the uh, International uh, Conference of ICOM at Kyoto. And uh, it's an open forum on practical challenges regarding ethical dilemmas. And it's a space where museum professionals can reflect, share, and discuss ethical dilemmas. And we are here to help them make more informed choices. So IC Ethics is one of ICOM's uh, 32 international committees. And uh, I leave now the floor to uh, uh, our board member, uh, Suze Anderson, who's moderating the session on the state uh, of uh, the Code of Ethics today. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Lena. So as Lena said, my name is Suze Anderson. Uh, as well as being a member of IC Ethics, I'm program head of the Museum Studies Program at George Washington University. Um, I'm a white woman with reddish hair who uses she, her pronouns. I'm wearing everything green, a green top, green glasses and green rectangular earrings. And I'm currently located in Baltimore, Maryland, which is on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway and Susquehannock uh, uh, nations. And Baltimore continues to be home to members of many tribal nations and most notably the Lumbee peoples. So since 2019, I've been teaching a course on museum ethics and values. Um, I see a lot of former and current students here. So hello to any of my students who are here. And in this, in this class, we consider both formal codes of ethics as well as ethical dilemmas confronting the profession, often quite emergent. And this sometimes is a gap between what we notice in the formal codes of ethics and these sort of specific emergent dilemmas, things that are coming up regarding new technology or labor practices in museums, thinking about environmental sustainability. And right now, we're at a really interesting moment in the sector where those formal codes of ethics are being redeveloped in several organizations, several professional organizations at one time. And I wanted to take this moment to bring together people from those organizations, as well as some other uh, professionals and provocateurs who could give us some context to talk about the codes of ethics and how they relate to the ethical dilemmas we face in the field every day. 
So today we're exceptionally lucky to have guests such as Sally Yurkovich, who is from the ICOM Standing Committee on Ethics, Julie Hart from the American Alliance of Museums, India Divers from the Museums Association in the UK, all of whom are in organisations currently in the process of rethinking their codes of ethics. We're also going to hear from Teresa Shiner from uh, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and museum ethicist Janet Marstein. I've asked each of these guests to prepare a short contextualizing presentation about their work or their current thinking. Then we'll come together for a discussion. We have many rich people, uh, you know, rich participation here in the chat. I'm going to invite people to pop questions in the chat as you think of them. Although our meeting time is relatively short and we probably won't get to them all. I'm going to host a moderated discussion at the end of the formal presentations. Um, and I've got a couple of questions that I want to do to try and unpack the connections between these different presenters. And then we'll make sure that we have some time for audience discussion as well. So welcome everyone. Um, Sally, I'm going to turn to you first. So Sally Yurkovic has been engaged with ethical issues in museums throughout her career. A cultural anthropologist with more than 30 years of leadership experience in museums and cultural institutions, she teaches a course on ethical issues in museums at Columbia University. We really have to exchange notes. Dr. Yurkovich is leading the revision of the ICOM Code of Ethics for Museums, and she's been involved in reviewing ethical issues and professional standards for the American Alliance of Museums and the American Association of State and Local History. She's author of A Practical Guide to Museum Ethics, and she focuses on how museums will face ethical challenges of the future. Sally, welcome, and I hand over to you. Thank you, Suze, and thank you to IC Ethics for sponsoring this important discussion. It's great to be able to be here with um, my counterparts at the UK Museums Association and the American Alliance of Museums. Um, and Lena, if you could share my slides or Suze, whoever is sharing. Great. So um, next slide. So the ICOM Code of Ethics for Museum is a core document for all ICOM members. It was originally created in 1986 although ICOM had um, various forms of guidance before that time. The 1986 code was amended in 2001 and then changed further and adopted by the ICOM membership in 2004. Next slide. During the um, ICOM meetings in Kyoto in 2019 um, and during the discussions about the museum definition, it became apparent that while there was a disagreement about what should be included in the definition, there was also a broad consensus about the values that museums share. It was also clear that um, the code of ethics, the current code of ethics, um, did not address in full the social role that museums can play in empowering communities and promoting sustainability and human rights. So as a result, the um, Standing Committee on Ethics or ETHCOM recommended to the ICOM Executive Board that there be a review of the code to determine how it can be adapted to reflect present day concerns. Next slide. ETHCOM is committed to an open and transparent revision process. And as a result, it is, we developed a methodology that's centered around four consultations with the ICOM membership. Next slide. The first consultation, um, back one slide, please. Uh, the first consultation was in 2001, where we asked, should the code be revised and um, asked people to let us know what they felt was missing in the code. There was an overwhelming um, yes response to the first question and many suggestions um, given to us. We then moved into a second consultation in 2022, where we asked a more, um, we, we created a more detailed survey asking what should be changed or deleted and what should be added to the code. Next slide. 
the results of both of these consultations are on in the ICOM member space under the revision of the code of ethics. Um, both the um, overview of what was what we heard in consultation one, and also the um, the more detailed report on consultation two. Next slide. So we're now in the process of our third consultation. From the results of from what we heard in consultation two, we created an outline of a revised code, and the consultation is seeking comments on that revision. The consultation opened in June and ex will extend till the end of October um, in of this year. The um, and we're asking that responses come from the national and international committees, regional alliances, and affiliated organizations. From the second consultation, um, next slide, we heard that we should, the code should focus on five core topics. And these core topics form the basis of the outline that is the subject of the third consultation. Those topics are respons museums' responsibilities to communities, professional practices, both the professional practices on the part of the um, people who work in museums, as well as the responsibilities of the museums of museums to the people who work with them. The third core topic was the educational role of museums, the fourth collections and research, and the fifth the responsibilities of governing bodies and leadership. Again, these are the topics um, that are elaborated upon in the, um, in the third consultation by statements, and we're asking for responses on those. Next slide. The, this consultation will result in a draft of the revised code of ethics, which will be um, open and revealed to the membership in 2024 and will be the subject of the fourth consultation. And finally, in 2005, we hope to have a revised code of ethics to put before the ICOM membership to approve. Next slide. To supplement the, um, the consultation that's ongoing now, we are having a series of webinars. Two of those have already taken place. And the third, um, they're focused on generally on the revision process, as well as on the topics, the core topics in our outline. The um, topics on communities and professional practices were the subject of an out of a webinar in June, in July, sorry, earlier this month. In September, we will have two webinars on education, one on education and the second on collections and research. And then finally in October, we will have a um, webinar on the subject of the responsibilities of governance and leadership in museums. The webinars should be posted on the ICOM website for um, everyone to review if you haven't been able to attend them. And also members of the ethics committee are more than happy to, um, to create webinars for national committees, international committees, or regional alliances on the subject of the revision of the code. Next slide. So if you, um, as I said, individuals, well, the, the um, responses are being requested from the national committees, international committees, regional alliances, and affiliated organizations. As an individual, you should send your responses to your, um, the organization to which you are a member, and then those will be forwarded to the ethics committee um, by, the, by the committees. So um, we hope that you will all become engaged in this process, all ICOM members, and um, help us revise the code so that it reflects the values and the principles that are important to working in museums today. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak in this, um, in this webinar, and I look forward to questions. Sally, thank you. This is so exciting. I'm already so intrigued by these sort of changing 
values, these changing ideas that seem to be really animating this approach to, to the code. Um, we'll, we'll keep going through our speakers, though, before we dig into it too far, because I think there's going to be some interesting moments of symmetry and maybe tension. India, I'd like to turn to you next. So India Divers uh, is a policy and campaigns officer for the Museums Association in the UK. It's a UK-wide professional body representing everyone who works in and with museums. In her role, she's responsibility for the MA's climate justice campaign, the MA's advocacy work in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and she's leading the review of the MA's code of ethics. India, welcome. Thank you, Sue. So, so I'll just start off with a, a visual description quickly. Um, so I am a white woman with a long curly dark brown hair. I'm wearing a black and white dress and my pronouns are she, her. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, so uh, the Museums Association is a UK wide professional body representing everyone who works in and with museums. We represent over 1,500 museums and 10,000 individual members. We are a campaigning organisation and our key campaigns include the Museums Change Lives campaign that highlights the social impact that museums have, uh, decolonisation, anti-racism and climate justice. Uh, the Museums Association's Code of Ethics sets out the key ethical principles and supporting actions that UK museums should take to ensure an ethical approach to their work. It supports museums to recognise and resolve ethical issues and conflicts. Uh, so the code applies to governing bodies, uh, to those who work for museums, and that includes paid staff and unpaid staff, so volunteers, uh, to consultants and those who are freelance, and to those who work or govern organisations that support, advise or provide services to museums, so that includes the Museums Association. And the MA expects all in institutional, indivi individual and corporate members uh, to uphold and to promote the code of ethics for museums. Uh, so the current version of the Museums Association's Code of Ethics was produced in 2015 and is based on really thorough discussions with the whole sector. Uh, so there are three key principles in the MA Code of Ethics, which are uh, public engagement and public benefit, stewardship of collections and individual and institutional integrity. So looking at the first principle, first of all, public engagement and public benefit. Um, so there's, it was really important for us to centre this uh, principle as, as the first one. And uh, it sets out that museums and those who work in and with them should actively engage and work in partnership with existing audiences and reach out to new, uh, new and diverse audiences. Uh, treat everyone equally with honesty and respect, provide and generate accurate information for and with the public, support freedom of speech and debate, use collections for public benefit, so for learning, inspiration and enjoyment. Uh, the second uh, principle, stewardship of collections, sets out that museums and those who work in and with them should maintain and develop collections for current and future generations, acquire, care for, exhibit and loan collections with transparency and competency in order to generate knowledge and engage the public with collections treat museum collections as cultural, scientific or historic assets and not financial assets. And uh, the third principle, individual and institutional integrity, sets out that museums and those who work in and with them uh, should act in the public interest in all areas of work, uphold the highest level of institutional integrity and personal conduct at all times, uh, build respectful and transparent relationships with partner organisations, governing bodies, staff and volunteers to ensure public trust in the museum's activities. Uh, so since the Museums Association last reviewed the Code of Ethics, uh, which was the period of 2014 to 15, there have been significant changes in the sector and society, uh, such as the COVID pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement and the cost of living crisis. Uh, the work of the Museums Association and the sector has moved on since the last code. For example, uh, uh, we actively campaign on uh, the role of the sector in tackling climate justice and addressing colonial legacies, in becoming anti racist institutions, and in prioritising workforce well being. So, we really recognise the need to review the Code of Ethics to consider these changes and the ethical ramifications they may have. Uh, while the themes I highlighted are some of 
the areas we think may arise during the consultation. We're not going into the review with uh, preconceived ideas. There may be different themes that emerge uh, during consultation that I've not identified just now. Uh, so it is going to, again, be in, in really um, collaborative discussion with the sector. And uh, the, so, yeah, the review of the code uh, will be in full consultation with the sector and key stakeholders. And that's uh, everyone in the sector, that, like I mentioned before. So it includes volunteers, um, people that work uh, in and with museums. Um, uh, and as part of the consultation, we'll have a survey and we will likely set up some virtual roundtables. And that uh, also uh, is a bit of different from last time we did it. Last time we did road shows uh, throughout the UK, but this time ways of working have changed. It's likely we'll do uh, predominantly the consultation online. Um, uh, we have recruited a working group to complete the work and make recommendations to the Ethics Committee and the MA Board. Uh, so the announcement of that's coming very soon of, of the membership for, for that working group. And uh, the review will assess the effectiveness, effectiveness of the code, guidance and advice and recommend any changes to improve uh, support for members and encourage ethical practice in the sector. So this could include revisions to the uh, text of the Code of Ethics, proposals for additional guidance or resources and changes to how the Ethics Committee works and supports the sector. So we will bring, begin consultation very shortly and the final version uh, of the revised Code of Ethics will be agreed at the Museums Association's AGM in autumn 2024. And just to finish, I just wanted to flag um, our new uh, disposals toolkit off the shelf uh, toolkit for ethical transfer, reuse and disposal. Uh, so. Uh, Sarah Briggs, my colleague, uh, has been leading on this. She's the Collections Development Officer for the Museums Association. And at the Museums Association, we believe that uh, mu museums need to ensure their collections are well managed, actively used and, and sustainable, and that deaccessioning is an everyday and necessary part of collections management. So the MA's toolkit is designed to support museum workers to grasp the challenge of our rapidly increasing collections and undertake active disposal and uh, the code of ethics supports decisions around disposal disposal especially um 2.9 that recognizes the principle that collections should not normally be regarded as financially negotiable assets and that financially motivated disposals risk damaging public confidence in museums and the uh, MA's ethics committee are also there to offer support uh, for significant challenges that may arise uh, when doing this work around disposal as well uh, so thank you very much Amazing. Um, India, thank you. Again, there's so much I want to dig into uh, already. This is very, very exciting, not least of all the time, the time frame in which this, these changes have been happening. Julie, though, Julie Hart is Senior Director for Museum Standards and Excellence at the American Alliance of Museums. She has been engaged with efforts to nurture institutional excellence throughout her 25 plus year tenure at AAM. And as Senior Director for Museum Standards and Excellence, she provides leadership and oversight of its Continuum of Excellence, a pathway of standards-based programs, including AAM's accreditation and museum's assessment program, as well as standards and ethics initiatives and issues in the US. She has an extensive history of providing training, advice, and insight on US museum and nonprofit standards, ethics, accreditation models, both domestically and internationally, including with partners in Italy, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, and China. She holds an MA in art history from the George Washington University. Huzzah. Julie, over to you. Thank you, Suze, and I really appreciate the invitation to join such an esteemed panel. Let me bring up my slides for you. Well, let me start with just a few words about the American Alliance of Museums. Um, I'm going to refer to that as AAM throughout this presentation. But AAM was founded in 1906 and is the only US-based museum service organization that is serving and representing the entire scope of the museum field. You know, that's sort of, we say museums from A to Z, art museums to zoos and everything in between. So all sizes and types, not just our members. And of course, museum professionals that do all manner of jobs. 
Uh, our organization is a private nonprofit. I just want to point that out. It is not a government entity or a government run entity or funded entity. And our mission is to champion equitable and impactful museums by connecting people, fostering learning and community and nurturing uh, museum excellence. So I want to take you on a little uh, history lesson here and look back at where how we got to today in terms of AAM's Code of Ethics for Museums. Uh, we started out with the first Code of Ethics published by AAM in 1925, and it was called the Code of Ethics for Museum Workers. And you can tell by the title, it's very people-focused, almost entirely people-focused. It covered the relationships between museums, museums and the public, the director and the trustees, the director and the staff, and interestingly, the staff and the director. So they were; those are two different things, two different perspectives, as well as relationships between museum staff members themselves. There were only a few sentences in there referring to collections, essentially just saying that the museum is there to preserve and protect the collections. And there's some information about acquisitions and sharing collections, meaning loans. But again, very individual and people focused. So let's uh, jump way into the future. 53 years down the road, uh, AAM came out with its new version just called Museum Ethics. You can tell, you can see that the word code wasn't even used. It really was more of a book. It was a 30 page booklet with very detailed guidelines um, about collections, the staff, museum management policy, and museum governance. These four bullet points are the section headers. And it was very in-depth and it almost kind of veered into an operational manual for, for museums. So it was very different than the first one. And then 13 years later, kind of screeched to a halt, turned around and kind of went a very different direction, pulled back and in 1991 through 94, the code of ethics, sort of the, the version essentially that we use today is uh, broken up into three sections, collections, governance, and programs. And each one of those sections has approximately 10-ish bullet points that are kind of these very broad statements that in each of those categories. So you can tell it was very sort of slimmed down. It kind of went from very sort of operational and very detailed to back up to the high level. And again, what you see here is the, the people went out of it from that original version you saw um, in even the 1978 version also. Um, the people have kind of disappeared out of this code. The governing, when it talks about governance, it's really referring to the governing body, not even necessarily individual trustees. And uh, the, the people who work, run the museum, work in the museums is kind of at, is absent from this. And so this code was created in 91 with a few uh, adjustments in 94. And then it went back and had some revision, very small revisions in 2000 and 2001, but they really weren't substantive. So what we're talking about is, um, this is the code that we are using today. And just to throw a little wrench in it, in between those, all of that, uh, we did, AAM also issued something called the, um, in 1996, with a revision in 2005, we issued the core standards for museums. They were originally called the characteristics of an accreditable museum or characteristics of excellence. And these are 38 broad, outcome-based statements that fall into seven categories. Uh, and, you know, they're phrased as um, statements of, that explain the outcome. They don't prescribe and talk about how you might do that because every museum will get to that end result slightly differently. And uh, we did bring in some uh, points about people back in here. Um, and this is also first time education was mentioned. Uh, it wasn't in any of the code. So the issue of museum, the museum as an educational entity was brought into the core standards. And then also in between all this, AAM has issued various 
ethics guidelines, kind of one-off things that talk about a specific issue that may have been a contemporary hot topic, um, donors, sponsorship of exhibitions, direct care collections, handling and addressing Nazi era assets, things like that. So we have this kind of uh, constellation of things. So where are we now and what's next? Well, as you can tell from this little history lesson, the uh, code of ethics hasn't been really revisited in of 20 years and let alone fully revised in over 30 years. So we are starting the process now. It's kind of been laying the groundwork for a little while, but really want to get going in this year and the next year and a half to revise our code of ethics, take a really deep look at it. One is to uh, better align it with the core standards because there is, um, while there is a little bit of overlap between the core standards and the code of ethics, uh, not an exact wording, but some points of sort of similar gist and themes that we want to make sure we try to um, align yet differentiate those two documents and also try to coalesce some of these other separate guidelines that we have, see how we can look at something more holistically. Um, obviously, it needs to be much more people focused and better address contemporary issues as we have heard already today, um, all manner of DEAI issues as they relate to various operational areas, decolonization and repatriation of collections, environmental stewardship, workplace equity. You know, these are just a few examples. Um, I'm sure we have very similar types of issues that are arising from all of our various consultations. And our process is we will have a task force that will, similar to our other uh, the other revisions going on uh, include multiple rounds of input from our stakeholders in the United States. So that's where we are on our code of ethics. Lovely, Julie, thank you so much. Now, Teresa, uh, Teresa has had some uh, challenges getting her camera working, but hopefully we can have, we can hear from Teresa. So Teresa Christina Shiner is professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro or Uni Rio. With 50 years of academic experience in museology, she's acted as director of the School of Museology and as a founding member and coordinator of the graduate program in museology and heritage. From 2011 to 2023, she was coordinator of the doctoral course in museology and heritage. Her academic background includes a Bachelor of Science in Museology, as well as a Master and PhD in Communication and Culture. And she's been an active member of ICOM since 1982, serving as Vice President and President of ICO, ICOFOM, I never know how to say that correctly, it never rolls off the tongue, as a member of the ICOM Ethics Committee from 2000 to 2006, as a member of the ICOM Executive Council and a Vice President of ICOM from 2010 to 2016. She was also Chief Editor of Museum International. So, Teresa, um, please tell us about the situation in Brazil. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I thank Lina very much for this invitation. It is quite challenging to uh, participate again uh, in um, a virtual mode. Uh, we would certainly prefer to be all of us together, but I first thing I noticed is that this is a conference by women. I think this is a good sign. Very good sign. Uh, hello to everybody. I have some Brazilian colleagues assisting as well, people from everywhere. Um, I decided not to bring a slide presentation because the history of um, the ethic uh, and the museum performance in Brazil is so big. It's uh, almost a hundred years by now and it's uh, quite linked to uh, the uh, capacity building of museum personnel. Uh, so I decided just to make a small print. I will speak just for seven minutes, as I promised. And then I'm going to read in order to make up my time. So, well, Brazil has a long history concerning the professional exercise of museum personnel 
in direct relationship to museum ethics. It started in 1932 with the establishment of the museum's course, a professional school of technical and superior level created in Rio de Janeiro at the National History Museum. The first two generations of conservators graduated in this course contributed to shape and define the landscape of professional action in the country, always in very close relationship with ICOM, which had as one of its founding members, our Brazilian professor Mario Barata. In September 1958, ICOM UNESCO organized in Rio de Janeiro a regional seminar on the educational role of museums, which among other issues reinforced that those aspiring the position of museum curators should have adequate training at university level in museology and museography. In 1960, the Brazilian government defined the rights and duties of museum conservators and created specific working positions for them at national level. In 1963, a Brazilian Association of Museologists, ABM, was created, stimulating national debate around the ethical rights and limits of museum workers. Uh, it has had for many decades the same importance as AEM in USA. That was our ABM. Uh, in 1966, because of the action of ABM, the course was renamed as Museology Course, granting a diploma of museologists to those professionals now fully recognized by the state. Well, all of that was done in very, very close action with ICON. Uh, but only in December 1984, after a long mobilization at national level, the exercise of the professional uh, of museologists was regulated in all its modalities. A federal council of museology, COFEM, and regional councils of museology, COREMS, were instituted as organs of professional register and fiscal inform enforcement of the law. Among other duties, the Federal Council advocated that museums adopt museological and museographical techniques suggested by ICOM. In 92, eight years after the enforcement of the law, a formal code of professional ethics was approved and started to be applied. This first version of the code established the basic norms and principles that should guide professional exercise, indicating norms of conduct and regulating their relationships with the pairs, with the public powers, with the public of museums and with society as a whole, in a very, very open-minded way. The text was divided into five main axes. Four of them established the basic professional duties and prohibitions, ethical positioning concerning the pairs, ethical duties concerning cultural and environmental heritage. We have always dealt with heritage in an, a very enlarged way and also towards the public. The fifth X defined the disciplinary infractions and applicable penalties to those who did not observe the ethical principles. ICOM is mentioned in three articles of this first version of our code. In 2021, a revision of the code was made uh, with public uh, consultation and a new version of the Professional Code of Ethics in Brazil was approved and promulgated in August that year. The text introduces new and more detailed articles concerning issues related to ethical behavior, responsibility, legality, freedom, autonomy and quality of work environment, as well as a chapter related to the rights of professional exercise, better qualifying infractions and penalties for abuse. Yet it must be noted that to the present day in Brazil, no museologist has ever been prohibited of professional exercise, and we can uh, talk about that later. But uh, the regulation of professional exercise is not limited in Brazil to the ethics code. 
it is also one of the attributions of the statute of museums instituted by the Brazilian government in January 2009. This is the key document that regulates the relationships of the Brazilian state to the musealized heritage. It defines museum and relationships between the public power, museums, and Brazilian heritage, and it declares of public interest the cultural property existent in museums and its diverse manifestations, all kinds of museums. Uh, it also states that museums must keep duly qualified personnel for the fulfillment of their goals and aims. According to the statute, museums must connect under a system, it's a form of system, the Brazilian system of museums, and consequent subsequent uh, networks that always exist. The statute also regulates the creation and extinction of museums, their official denomination, organic framing within the pu public sphere, and mode of operation. One interesting issue included is that it grants to organized communities in Brazil the right to express their views and op opinions over the processes of identification or and definition of the heritage to be musealized. In January 2009, in the same year, a Brazilian Institute of Museums, IBRAM, was also created with the aim of promoting and fostering the implementation of public policies for the museological sector, where museums and cultural centers fully participate. In 2013, the two laws were reinforced and regulation, regulated by another decree. One of the most important duties of Vibran up to the present days is to promote the systematic inventory of musealized cultural assets and the implementation of the National Register of Museum. Uh, and one of its main consequences uh, was the diversification of capacity building experiences in country. Brazil has now 14 graduation courses in museology and five graduate programs that offer five master courses and one doctoral course, all of them subject to the National Code of Ethics and to the ICOM Code of Ethics. Well, I think this is about seven minutes. Uh, we could talk more later. Thank you. Teresa, thank you. And you've raised some really provocative questions within there that I do think we should dig into in a few minutes. Okay. Our, last, uh, our last of our speakers um, is Janet Marstein. Janet Marstein is Honorary Associate Professor of Museum Studies, now retired at the University of Leicester in the UK, and is currently an independent scholar based in Yarmouth, Maine. She writes on diverse aspects of museum ethics, from curatorial ethics to negotiating the pressures of self-censorship to artists' interventions as drivers for ethical change. Marstein is the author of six books and has received grants from the Institute of Museums and Library Services in the US, the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, and the British Academy. Marstein has particular interest in supporting the agency of practitioners to make informed ethical decisions. She sat on the Ethics Committee of the UK's Museums Association from 2014 to 2019, helping to move their approach from one of policing to empowering. Janet, welcome to the session. I'm really excited to hear your perspective. Thank you very much. Let's see. Okay, can everyone see the screen? We can, we can see your side slides as well, but I okay. think that's fine. Uh -huh. Let's see. Okay, so yes, uh huh. So um, 
I want to do a little bit more blue skies thinking with uh, with you all, um, doing a bit of critique of ethics codes, not that they're not important, not that we don't want to discard them, but, um, uh, but to perhaps champion and prioritize a values-driven approach uh, more highly and think about its role in relation to codes. So, and it's so exciting to see um, all of these organizations rethinking their codes. So not just piecemeal revising, but doing really some rethinking. So uh, um, it's very, very exciting uh, and particularly the, the UK Museums Association. And of course, I, I have to say, because I, I help to, uh, to, to play a role in the 2014-15 code, um, I guess I have a bit of bias there, but also to see that um, less than 10 years later, they're already doing another rethinking. Um, uh, I understand that um, it's very resource intensive to um, to uh, to revise a code, particularly because of uh, all of the kind of consultation that's involved in it. Um, but if we can think about these codes also as something that are living and breathing, um, more dynamic, it's ultimately more healthy for us. So in any case, um, of course, codes are important. They, um, they, are, uh, they are rules that uh, um, for individual content in professional practice, um, they distinguish public service from personal gain and political interest, and they encourage skill development and standard setting. And they're particularly important um, at particular times. So, for example, um, when a museum sector is, uh, um, is particularly uh, in a developmental stage, or particularly at moments of crisis, for example, economic crisis, uh, those standards are, are very, very important. Oops, let's see here what's going on. Uh, I don't know why I'm not able to move this forward. There we go. Um, but of course, there are all kinds of complexities and contradictions when we think about ethics codes. So for example, there's no such thing as universality. Um, one code can be interpreted differently in many different contexts. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, when we think about uh, the code, um, the ICOM code in Brazil, it's going to be understood potentially in very different ways than it might be in Japan or in Norway. Um, and also diverse codes and conventions will contradict one another. So, uh, for example, uh, a friend of mine in Australia, um, who was at the time, a colleague of mine who was at the time a chief repatriations officer at the National Museums of Australia, um, wrote a lovely paper for a book of mine um, that talked about the minefields of having to um, think about uh, indigenous ethics while he's also thinking about uh, uh, anthropological ethics, while he's having to be think having to think about the ethics of the um, uh, National Museums, oh, excuse me, Na of Australian Museums Association and ICOM, and of course some of these are going to clash. So you have to really be engaged, uh, firmly engaged in what's between the lines, um, in the messiness of ethics not just in the codes themselves. Now, I don't know why I'm having such troubles here. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, 
Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm. Oh, let's see here. I skipped this slide. I'm going to have to. Let's see here. Let's see if this does better. All right. So ethics codes can be problematic also in the way that they are compliance based tools. So basically, in their nature, they are about how you must comply with certain things. And as we know from the histories that you provided, they're static and they're fixed. Um, so what does it mean when because of the resource that's involved in revising an ethics code, you aren't able to do that kind of revision that's needed for 20 or so years? They can be reactive then. Um, they can echo legal documents in their tone as well because of that compliance uh, almost policing based nature of them. They can be authoritarian also in the, in the voice of them. Um, and as much as we try to reach out and do these consultations, nonetheless, still um, there is this sense of the fact that there are experts in the room that are still making the final decisions. So from my perspective, relying on codes alone encourages too passive of an approach to ethics. So they become a go-to resource when you hit an emergency and they don't, they don't provide the kind of rect the kind of resource that practitioners need to analyze the real messiness of the ethical dimensions that practitioners encounter on an everyday basis. So one thing that I really appreciate of that 2014-15 MA Ethics Code in the introduction is a, a statement um, that says that ethical reflection is an essential part of everyday museum practice. So that we all need to really be thinking all the time about ethics. And that, um, that no, it's not just the domain of those experts, quote unquote, that it's part of all of our work across the museum uh, for all staff. And the second line here in this part of the introduction also I think is very important that says that this code cannot contain all the answers to the ethical issues that museums face. So it's an acknowledgement that the code is really only a skeleton, a really only a start to much more complex conversations that we all need to be having with our colleagues. And I think underneath that, lying underneath that, is the concept of ordinary or everyday ethics, that we need to recognize the agency of practitioners, that all of us have ethical expertise, whether it's in our everyday lives that, you know, we have no, we decide to uh, have no I'm sorry, it's raining so hard right now. We are going to hardly hear my own voice. Whether we have no, no mo, no mo may um, to attract the bees, or whether we deliver food to our neighbor who needs help, but we're all thinking about ethics on an everyday basis. So we need to recognize that among practitioners and build on that. Um, so that notion of everyday ethics should be an empowering thing that we practice and think about across the museum and also with our publics. So I like also to think about a values-driven approach. So thinking that ethics is not just about a code, but also about values. 
And it was fascinating to hear from many of you that you're thinking along the same lines, that ethics should be based on shared core values of the institution and the sector to drive ethical decision-making and action. So when we think about values-driven approaches, this encourages engagement and critical thinking across the museum about difficult ethical issues. So where a code-driven approach is more compliance-based and depends on the imposition of external controls, a values-driven approach asks practitioners to internalize institutional or sect and or sectoral values. And the hope, of course, is that those institutional and personal values of the staff member will be largely aligned. And of course, it requires leaders of the institution and the sector to model those values. So one example I would say would be with the Burke Museum at the University of Washington. And I don't have time to read all of it, but you can see that it uses those values of respect, integrity, stewardship, equity, collaboration, and, and, and curiosity as those key values. And interestingly, it bundles those values with, um, with a statement about the, um, the land and its indigenous owners, uh, original owners, and also uh, its uh, DEI policy as well. So it sees those three things really as one. And I wanted to end also with a kind of interesting thought about the MA approach to ethics, which in an interesting way, I think, um, links uh, values with the code. So um, in one way, we might think of public engagement and public benefit um, as India mentioned, and stewardship at the second one, as the second principle, and the third major principle in the MA Ethics Code as integrity. Those three principles um, uh, as a kind of, as values in a way. What is the difference between a principle and a value? So we can argue that out as, um, you know, as philosophy for a long time, but they are principles, they are values on some level and the code is um, embedded within that. So they have, without really articulating that, they have, um, they have linked the two, but it's interesting as India talks, she has, uh, she has shown us in many ways how what the what the MA has done since then is almost gone ahead in terms of their actions, um, their ethical actions gone ahead of the MA ethics code. And now they have to go back and revise an ethics code so that it reflects those ethical actions with a, a, a wider set of values. So I'm curious to see how that goes. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Lovely, Janet, thank you so much. Well, I do have a couple of prepared questions. I, I see our, um, we have our participants list and I've had a couple of people send me questions, but I'd like to start with a few of my burning questions. This is a topic I've been thinking about for a while. So the first one I'm going to actually pick up from where you were, Janet. Ethical dilemmas are deeply complex. They're specific. They're grounded in particular institutions. They're unique circumstances. They're very specific publics and staff members. But codes of ethics are abstract and simplistic. And as Janet notes, they're often contradictory. I'd really like to ask our guests what they think the ideal relationship is between the code and 
the institutions and people who are putting them into practice and how they want people to use their codes. I might start with India because I think the Museums Association has been doing such an interesting approach with this, with the campaign approach to this. So can you start us off with an answer to that? Yes, thank you, Suze. So yeah, I, I do think um, Janet touched on this a little bit already, the idea that it's not necessarily as really strict set of instructions that you know you you follow to the letter it's more about uh taking that code and, and and actively thinking about it in your own context and and really thinking about ethics in your kind of everyday work uh as a as a museum worker as a leader of a museum so i i do think there is needs to be that relationship where it's not um necessarily uh the ma T -t telling you exactly what you should be doing it's about it's about um uh, as a museum worker really thinking about what you should be doing and using um the code to, to guide that thinking um we also have our ethics committee uh that can really help with supporting uh these decisions uh but i think we're, we're really keen at the emmy that the ethics committee isn't seen as you know gatekeepers of of this of the code and ethical practice that is really there to support that thinking and a lot of the time when people come to us with ethical inquiries and they're not sure what to do a lot of what we'll do is go back with more questions for them and and questions for them to consider rather than stating what you know the right course of action is a lot of the time it is more a set of a process to think of um you know questions to spark that thinking and to guide them around the right path to, to make that decision that's right for their institution and their, their circumstance that they're in yeah it's something i actually really like about your code of ethics is it treats ethics or the way i read it it sort of treats ethics as practice and that's something i talk about a lot with my students that ethics is an active practice that you should be engaged in and the ma code it you know in the guidance at the start it tells people like what you should be doing is you should be gathering information and making sure that you're talking to all of the right people and um, going through the possibilities of what happens if you take certain kinds of actions. And so it seems as ethics, as practice, as this act, as sort of engaged, active thing rather than sort of a passive process. Sally, I want to throw to you in, in this moment and think, you know, ICOM is dealing with a massive array of international contexts in trying to craft a code. And you mentioned the idea that, you know, this is a values driven code, but values are different with different publics. They're different in different national contexts and international contexts. The complexity of that, of trying to simplify this into something that speaks for a whole sector with different legal contexts, as well as sort of, uh, as I say, sort of cultural contexts, must be vastly complex. How do you try and reconcile these different needs and these different publics, as well as the, the different sort of circumstances in which the code will be used? You're muted. Thank you. Um, it's obviously a huge challenge and um, one that we're very aware of. Our code is used in a lot of different ways, depending upon um, you know, the, the circumstances of the individual museums. So we see it as um, you know, sort of a points of departure for museums to think about some of these issues, realizing that not everyone um, has the resources or the ability to <clears throat> fulfill the code by the, the, the letter of the law, um, but hoping that the code can provide guidance and help, particularly in situations where um, perhaps um, a museum is in a country where standards for museums are not understood. And therefore, um, they can point to the code as, um, as you know, their aspiration as a museum or as, as points of their aspiration. But it is a it is an enormous challenge. I mean, ICOM has been somewhat successful in its previous codes in providing that kind of guidance. And we rely a lot upon both the members of our committee and also the members of ICOM to help us sort through some of those some of the issues. 
We have um, broad representation on the ethics committee from parts of the world and um, languages, which is another issue um, because not all words are trans easily translated into other languages. There, are, so our the revision of the code and the discussions that we have are focused not just on the ethical issues, but also on the translation of the words that we're using. So um, it's a it's a huge challenge, but one that we feel um, you know, somehow with the help of all of our, our members, we can, um, we can meet and we can, we, we can meet. We hope to provide a more simplified code and then supplement that code with more guidance um, or guidelines so that um, perhaps we can, uh, we can meet some of those challenges that way. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, Teresa, I saw you nodding emphatically when we spoke about the translation questions and that different things mean, you know, different things in different languages. Can you speak about sort of the process of adoption then of trying to sort of bring ICOMS code into the Brazilian context and, and the, the kinds of questions that that brings up for you? Well, uh, at first, uh, when ICOM was created, uh, Brazil has immediately in 1948 established a ni national ICOM committee uh, here. So uh, we started to uh, work very close together with ICOM in every way. Uh, when uh, the code of ethics was defined, one Brazilian museologist was a member of the ICOM Executive Council, and she was struggling for the design of an international code of ethics. And of course, she was there putting uh, the Brazilian soul in it, let us say. Uh, so uh, it, uh, the enforcement of the ICOM code of ethics in Brazil has never been a problem. But uh, the translation of terms, yes, because uh, we usually have um, a tripod method. We usually uh, analyze the text of the codes after 1986, when Spanish was approved as a third language in French, in English, and in Spanish. And this is a problem because translations are really very, very complicated. The soul of the thing when it's written in, 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 in English, the French version is absolutely not the same. And the Spanish version, it's sometimes very far from it. I was a member of the ethics committee with Geoffrey Lewis, and I was the Spanish uh, speaking person. And this was an issue because when something was agreed, they would ask me, what about that in Spanish? I would say that has no meaning in Spanish. Absolutely, this is not going to function. So I, I, I am sure that this is what Sal is going on now. Now she's going through this issue, which is a, 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 a key issue because we cannot have a code that seems very beautiful in its wording, but it doesn't mean anything to anybody elsewhere. So, and I am speaking about the three official languages of ICOM. I can imagine that in, 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 in Japanese, in an Arabic country, whatever in uh, Kazakhstan, in many other languages. It, this is complicated. There's another thing that is uh, quite uh, peculiar. And I don't know if ICOM has um, deepened uh, the debates, internal debates on this issue, is the fact that in some things that seem natural to ICOM, uh, to the ICOM board and to the ICOM ethics committee are, are an issue in national situations. For example, 
community participation. In some countries, uh, the government does not allow community participation. So uh, we cannot just naturalize some beautiful ideas that we have because I think they are democratic, they are open, they uh, foster equality among members. Uh, we must be very careful about that because in some um, moments in some countries, in some national uh, situations, this will not function at all. There is also another issue that is uh, just uh, horizontally taken care in ICOM is the fact that we have in some countries um, the, 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 the framework of the museum sector is highly nationalized and depends on the um, national public policies, ethics, laws, whatever. You have to abide to that. There's no discussion, uh, no matter what you think about, or museums will not exist. Uh, you don't get funding. You don't get uh, professionals in your museums. In other cases, such as in the United States, for example, everything is diversified. It's a... Uh, um, uh, it's like a, a scene, it's, it's like a wave. So um, it's completely different. Uh, in our case, when we say that uh, in Brazil and most South American countries that we abide to the ICOM code of ethics, it's not only because we like it, but because we are uh, members of UN, UNESCO, and our national systems are uh, centralized in the hands of the state, and we have to do it. We have to abide to that, uh, green or not. Yeah, absolutely, Teresa. I mean, I think this gets to some of the complexities that we're dealing with in, in trying to think about these codes of ethics. Yeah, I have one more yeah. question that I want to ask, and I, I'd really like to ask, actually, um, our three people from professional pro associations, uh, but, but all of our guests, and then I want to move into questions from our guests or from our participants. But one of the reasons I really wanted to host this session today is it is incredibly rare that any sector organisation revisits their code of ethics. I mean, we were sort of talking about how long change has been, you know, in AAM's case, it was a sense of at least 23 years, possibly 30, if we consider substantive change. We have Museums Association UK much more recently. Um, but we've now got three organizations that are revisiting their code at this moment. And I'm curious about what you all think that says about the sector, about the way it's shifting, it's changing expectations and priorities, both internally and externally, that such a momentous change is happening now. Teresa, you also mentioned that this happened uh, very recently in Brazil in 2021, but I'd like to sort yeah. of get a sense of like, what is happening now, and how does this sort of indicate a bigger shift that's happening within the way you think about the work and role of museums in general? Um, Sally, I saw you unmute yourself, so I'm going to throw to you first, and then I'd like to come to Julie, um, because Julie, we haven't heard from you in this context, and in just a moment, I will throw to audiences, so be thinking about if you have questions that you want to ask, you can throw them in the chat, or you can raise your hand when we finish this question. Sally. Thank you. Uh, well, I think we've all noticed or, or noted in our comments in one way or another that um, the revision of the code is the, the revision of all of our codes is in response to the enormous changes that have happened or that we see in society. And the changing relationship of museums to the communities that they work with. The, if you read, our, I think probably all of our codes very closely, you can tease out some of the issues that we've been dealing with more frequently now, but it's not as obvious as it should be or as we feel it should be. So issues of diversity, issues of equity, um, issues of sustainability obviously are, are, have become really important to museums. And it's, it's the larger societal changes I think that we feel we need to be responsible to, uh, responsive to as museums um, so that we can uh, continue to remain relevant and 
trusted by our audiences. So I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's the all of the shifts that have been happening in the past five to 10 years that are sort of coming to the fore and demanding that these changes be made. Yeah, I think a lot about this sort of question of relevance and, and I think about a person who joined the museum profession in the early 2000s, who might be halfway through their professional life at this moment, who's thinking about museums has changed and has shifted and who has never had the opportunity to participate in the creation of one of these formative value statements for the sector. And to me, that is kind of shocking that someone could be like me. I'm, I'm probably mid-career and this would be my first chance to participate in one of these. And I think that's a really interesting indication of thinking about how the sector can adapt to shifts in its internal sense as well as those external sense. Julie, can you speak to, to the same question of why you see this as sort of this urgent thing that's happening now and what that says about the sector? Right. Well, obviously the museums are in, um, and the museum sector it, immensely impacted by all of the socio-economic political um, changes that are happening so rapidly. So they have to react quickly to, and so we need to have as the professional organization also the guidance to help them. So we're kind of behind the curve on that. And, you know, starting out, there's been the monumental shift, not just of the recent issues, but just over the past couple of decades, the shift from the primacy of, it was all about collections, museums were about collections, it was about the curatorial voice, the expertise, the museum being the expert telling you what you need to learn, what you need to know, and how that's really turned upside down, um, that museums are about people, the communities, uh, the inclusiveness of voices, and um, so it's really kind of turned the whole sort of traditional and the, of the past museum model upside down and our codes need to keep up with that. And one thing I did want to mention that kind of goes back to the earlier question of how do you connect the big idea, big you know, institution of the code of ethics that these organizations put out in the daily life on the ground of museums and what they have to deal with. And one of the strategies that AAM uses is we have something called core documents. It's kind of a companion to our core standards. And we've identified five core documents that we think are critical for just every museum to have as the most pro basic profession, you know, to be a basic professional organization. And really all of them go back to risk management. And one of them is the code of ethics, an institutional code of ethics. So we really encourage all of the museums in the United States, and we require it, if you're going to be accredited, to have an institutional code of ethics. And that is not one where you just put your name on the top of the AM code of ethics. We're adamant about that is not acceptable. We have a series of criteria, and it's really, you need to write a code of ethics for your institution that um, you have sit down and taken a thoughtful process to think about all the ethical issues that impact or could impact your institution because the type of collections it has, the type of community it's in, et cetera, and write a code that is customized to you and some of your issues that will help give you those guardrails to make good, consistent decisions when you have crises and ethical challenges come up. So that's kind of our, our connection point is to use the um, institutional code of ethics and we provide a lot of resources and training and toolkits etc to help museums understand how to create their own document lovely thank you i want to throw to audience questions now i i realize we're short on time and i don't want to dominate everything um emlyn had a question emlyn reached out emlyn are you, do you want to sort of articulate further on what you asked Yes, thanks, uh, Susie. Um, hello. I'd like to um, open up the dialogue, if that's possible, sort of to a more global, um, wider level. Um, the museum profession serves the troubled planet. Let's put it on a, on a very wide footing, both its nature and its culture. And I think both society and the museum field are very human centric. And um, I think we we have never really asked ourselves as a museum profession or a sector, what is the most fundamental question that we should be answering or asking and answering when we come to mission and ethics statements? And I'll just 
say very briefly that I think this, this concept of generative conversation is most powerfully defined by an anecdote that I once heard from Harvard, where a, somebody comes into the boardroom and says to these eager trustees, I found the answer to your question. And the bright trustees say, uh, well, you actually haven't asked the right question yet. You haven't gone to the question within the question within the question. I think that there's evidence in our sort of periodic fiddling, if I may, with both ethics and mission statements of museums that we have really not asked the question that underlies all the other questions. And I think we can learn from the pandemic period where the only profession, the only sector which garnered the praise of society was the medical profession, which is bound by an oath that it shall do no harm. If we are to go back to the roots of uh, the raison d'etre of the museum field and realize that we're fundamentally about inspiring consequential reflection, then there would be no really need after that kind of umbrella understanding and reflection that we'd have to have nationally differentiated or, or field of museum differentiated purposes. We would all be bound and would buy this overarching statement. So I feel that the, the nature and culture split is severe. And I'd just like to add, if I may, that since ICOM has chosen, and I questioned uh, when I uh, resigned as Bob James did from the ICOM Sustainability Committee several years ago, that this term sustainability is so loaded and, and poorly defined and underused that I think it was an unfortunate wagon to hitch uh, ICOM's raison d'etre to. And, and as you may know, the, uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, are in the words of the Secretary General, and I quote, in deep trouble. And he said, if there was ever an illumination of the short-sightedness of our prevailing economic and political systems, it is the ratcheting up of the war on nature. And apropos, the UN chartered U University for Peace in Costa Rica, the director of that university recently said, Today, the construction of peace requires the protection of the planet. Environmental degradation caused by climate change is at the root of many conflicts and will become even more so in the near future. My point is that we are very internally focused. We can talk and write endlessly about codes and missions, but if we do not back these in to the fact that there is one Earth, there's one Earth human system, and that the humanosphere comprising the agency of museums ought to uh, in hindsight, have been much more focused on its own big picture and not be so narrow and 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 limited in thinking that it has to make its own and, and keep on fiddling with the statement that has never really been perfect in the first place. There is Emlyn, an overarching statement out there. Emlyn, I'm going to bring you in because I think there's some really interesting questions here and we have very limited time at this point and I want to sort of pull this in. India, I know that one of the things that you focus on is sort of environmental justice within your work. I, I believe that is true, if I'm not mistaken, within your campaigns. Can you then talk about this connection between these sort of large scale, sort of these almost global demands on us as institutions, and then the very specific needs of institutions? That, that feels like a real tension. And I'd love to hear how you're thinking about that in the Museums Association. And then next, uh, just to, so you know, so, um, Ren, I'm going to throw it to you next for your question. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, so, uh, it, it's been in the last few years that we launched our Museums for Climate Justice campaign. So, it's still a relatively new campaign. But uh, looking across the UK, I think uh, more and more museums are really recognizing uh, the role that their institution has in tackling climate justice and that's that's something that uh, we recognize in our campaign is uh the roles of museums in kind of inspiring that change in society for, through their audiences but also uh looking at themselves and thinking how, how they can make changes um that that um uh it have more a more positive impact on the planet think about their transition to net zero and it, when we look at kind of um uh, the political landscape as well. We're seeing more policies moving towards that as well that mu museums will have to adhere to. So I think, uh, you know, we need museums to be relevant to society. And I, I think this is something that all museums are really um, having to 
uh, question and having to embed into their practice. And that there's something that we're really advocating for through our campaign is for this to be uh, relevant museum work. This is core museum work, um, uh, tackling uh, climate injustice and our climate justice campaign as well. Uh, it really intentionally looks at that um, kind of social justice aspect as well of uh, 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 cl the climate uh, crisis. So, so not calling it the climate uh, uh, change campaign or the climate crisis campaign, but really looking at that climate justice element and looking at it is a global issue. And a lot of the time, uh, you know, the, the, the actions of um, the global north are having, you know, real impacts on the global south. So I, I think it is a, a global issue and, and something that where uh, museums can have real impact, especially in inspiring change through their audiences, but also looking at their own um, kind of actions. And uh, there's really a chance for us to Im embed this in, in, into into the code of ethics but like I say it's going to be quite an open consultation so so uh when we start the consultation we'll see uh what the views are of our members and beyond uh, because it, we're going to be consulting wider than our membership as well to, to really uh, find out what uh the sector in the UK thinks uh, should be embedded further into the code that's wonderful India thank you Ren do you want to speak to your question of this sort of gap between progressive and traditional values I think it's a really interesting question Sure. Um, and also, hi, Suze. I was, I think, in one of your first uh, ethics courses at GWU um, oh, back in 2019. Hi. So hello again. <laughs> um, so my, I think it's a safe statement to say that there's there can be some frustration in the museum field about how what feels like ethical issues are reacted to slowly. Um, and, you know, there there's a lot of, there tends to be a lot of progressive values in the employees and staff of museums, but they're constantly having to butt against like traditional values of what is exhibited or the way that museums make statements. Um, and so I think when it, we're thinking about large scale like ethics codes, um, there's a lot of things that I'm sure a lot of my colleagues would want in them, but are likely not gonna be put in them in order to be accepted by the public, I guess. Um, and so I guess my question is how do we bridge that gap between what is seen as progressive political if you're in America, um, like things that you know, really speak to the humanity for particularly for oppressed like groups of communities, like groups and communities. Um, so like where, how do you approach those topics when they are needed um, in order to still maintain the like perceived respect and um, I guess image for the public, like to, to, to maintain those traditional values that the museum tends to be seen as. Um, I feel like I have a lot of different ideas kind of pulling into it. I'm trying my best to like put it together <laughs> into a, a question. But yeah, so like how do we how do we approach those gaps um, moving forward? Who, who wants to take this question about the sort of values tensions? Um, I, I'd love to hear from anyone. Uh, Janet, I'm really interested to hear what you think on this, but I'd also like to hear from anyone who wants to speak to this. Well, I would certainly say that one of those things you have to have, I think, very clear um, uh, guidance within your institution around um, uh, self-censorship. I think that's really, really important because it's so easy for people to feel, for staff to feel self-censored. Um, and uh, around issues, curatorial issues, but but all kinds of other issues, um, you know, whether it's uh, programming issues or even around these issues around values. Uh, and um, so uh, if the staff feels like they can speak and be themselves, then I think that's really, really helpful. Um, so when we have these discussions around values, it shouldn't be a hierarchical discussion. Those discussions should be discussions where everyone feels included um, and, uh, um, and they should hopefully be discussions that um, where dissensus, not just consensus, is, uh, you know, is understood to be part of the process uh, and, um, and encouraged in, in many ways that a constructive conflict is part of getting somewhere. 
Uh, so that's within the institution. Um, but change is, you know, change is difficult and working with your audiences is also difficult. Um, so in terms of, you know, audiences understanding where you're coming from, again, having very clear protocols around self-censorship is very, very important so that you're not making quick decisions based on fear or based on, you know, um, uh, too quick risk assessment, what, you know, risk aversion, excuse me, too quick, too quick risk aversion that, um, you know, if you don't take this down, you could lose funding. There's so much fear of uh, audience disapproval, for example. But if you work with your audiences in advance, um, so that they know what to expect and why to expect it, um, so that you are transparent about things and you work with community groups and leadership in advance, then oftentimes um, you can have a more conducive experience uh, to doing new things. But, but of course it can be slow. I know even even among um, uh, even among uh, the the field, for example, when we uh, when we in the years after we changed the ethics code um, in the UK, I would still say that many um, many museum practitioners still saw the ethics committee as uh, as police and they would still come to us um, over and over and over again. I would still say that in those, you know, four or five years, um, uh, you know, between when the code was passed and um, when I left that 90% 85 or 90 percent of the material that we got was still around disposal. So, you know, should I, can I, can't I, or, you know, um, so we were still having to deal with a lot of that stuff rather than being proactive or other kind and other kinds of things. It was starting to change a bit, but it takes a long time to change. Um, I I will say um, we are officially over time by four minutes. I know there's a question by Yasmin Khan. So Yasmin, I want to come to you if there's time. But if anyone does have to hop off, uh, you are absolutely uh, not obligated to stay on, although it would be lovely if there's a couple of extra uh, moments for this final question. I do want to say also, Ren, just to, as an observation, one of the things I find, you know, as I've been thinking about ethical dilemmas myself, is that it is these tensions, whether it's between progressive and traditional values, so-called, whether it is um, sort of tensions between different publics and their needs, or it, it is actually where things pull against one another, that that's where our ethical dilemmas are most often located. It, it, you know, if there's things that have an easy answer, there's probably not going to be an ethical dilemma there, that our ethical dilemmas come from where we have these different needs, these different desires, or these different understandings of what the institution is. And so that's actually, I think, where we, where we can draw a lot of sort of our, our sense of these ethical dilemmas. Um, Yasmin, if you are uh, still here, uh, I would love to hear your question and then we will pull this in and, and wrap this up once we've had a chance to answer that. Hi everybody, hello. Um, really great talks, thank you so much. Um, my question is very simple really. Um, are there clear guidelines on ethical sponsorship from commercial corporations with colonial history? Good question. Uh, India, this is probably a question for you in a very specific sense, uh, uh, judging by the accent. <laughs> great, yeah, no, thanks for that question, Yasmin. So, um, the uh, Emmy's Code of Ethics um, does kind of state that uh, museums should be very careful and re really consider before accepting any kind of financial donation uh, um, uh, from a commercial organisation. And I think it's really about understanding 
the values of um, the organization uh, of the museum and making sure that any um, organization that you accept um, financial um, uh, support from uh, has a uh, kind of consistent ethical values uh, with, with you know your museum uh, so the emmy code of ethics doesn't um kind of state a, a list of uh kind of types of organizations that museums uh, should or shouldn't um accept uh financial donations from so it's really up to the institution to really reflect and and, and think about their own ethical values and and whether um this would would compromise and whether it's a good idea it's always worth thinking about institutional integrity and um what what uh, the ramifications of of accepting such a donation would be yeah lovely team we are at an end um, of our discussion today. So thank you, first of all, to each of my, our panellists. It has been so rich and so rewarding to hear from each of you. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues at IC Ethics. Um, this, is, this is our online mini conference. It has been a wonderful chance to come together and really talk about and think about the relationship between codes of ethics and the ethical dilemmas that we face in the field. Um, everyone who's come to the session today, I really hope you found it helpful and rewarding. We're going to have a video of the session online probably in the next few days, um, but you'll be able to find it online on our website, um, which I will put a link to in the notes right now. Um, the final thing is if you are a museum professional who is interested in or dealing with an ethical dilemma, um, we'd really invite you to get in contact with us. We can host these discussions. We do host these discussions. Um, if you have something you were thinking about or want to talk about further, please get in contact with us. I will put our email address in the chat as well. It's icom at ic-ethics.museum. We'd love to hear from you and use that to drive a future discussion. You can either be part of that discussion, or you can tell us a topic and we'll pull together some people to, to host it for you. Thank you, everyone. I apologize that we ran a couple of minutes over time, but this has been a delight and I very much appreciate the chance to talk with all of you. Thank you.